Hey guys. Okay, so I said I wasn't going to do it, and then I went ahead and did it. Uh, big honking space plane. I call it the albatross because why not, right? It's the albatross. Um, but yeah, there we go. There she is. Big giant honking space plane. How much does it weigh? Uh, 135 tons, uh, 79 parts. So it's not as big as um, the one that Eddie Neo. Uh, showed us there um, on Discord with the, the big giant. I think it was like two or three hundred tons or something like that. And inside it just had like every manner of science imaginable. Um, I play in sandbox because, well, basically um, because I, I, I mean, I've been playing since like 2012 or 2011 or something. And I, I've gone through career so many times, I, I just don't want to anymore. So I, I play in sandbox. I like fiddling around with the upper level stuff. Um, just because uh, it's just where I'm at right now um, but this this here this sp space plane is something that I might actually use so I went ahead and built it um, it doesn't have all the cool science doodads that you might expect um, I really just um, as far as what I'm looking for I, I'm looking for actual science so you know I, I care about temperature you know that's important um, gravity and uh, air pressure are important to me when I'm exploring planets as well as you got right down here the gas chromatograph uh, mass spec you might have seen me use that once or twice um, that's important to me too because I do want to know what you know atmospheres are made of uh, as well as what you know materials might be taken from the surface as well um, and if I had a probe you know if I had intended to land this in the water which I don't um, I'd throw you know a liquid uh, chromatograph on there as well but you know just knowing that there's uh, for instance um, helium-3 in teeny tiny amounts, but definitely, you know, oxygen and nitrogen in definitely large amounts, plus I can get some liquid water right out of the air. Um, so that tells me that this ship with a pebble bed reactor and hydrogen peroxide can refuel up in orbit um, from the atmosphere. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, so we can take off, uh, use hydrogen peroxide as its propellant um, once it's out of the atmosphere you know, once it's up in the thin layers of the atmosphere and then to establish orbit. And then it can skim the atmosphere um, in that low orbit and refuel. Um, yeah, uh, a few other doodads on here. We got a circular ultraviolet photovoltaic receiver, went with ultraviolet, uh, just because as far as what, you know, satellites I might be using in the future, I would use uh, an ultraviolet beam um, or an X-ray beam or something like that, you know, infrared for other things. Um, so, you know, just tailor it to the mission is, is all I do there. And of course, um, you know, a narrowband scanner uh, because, you know, as well as, you know, scanning the atmosphere, I also want to know about resources once again. Um, so you got one of those bad boys on there. So that's that. Okay. Um, not a lot of other science. Uh, down inside here, let's see if I can get the camera to cooperate. We've got um, obviously, you know, communications antenna. Um, right in the middle here, we have a refrigerator unit. Um, and then we've got, you know, a few fuel tanks for liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, and liquid water. Um, liquid ammonia and gaseous ammonia can be stored in the refrigerator. And then in the all-in-one refinery unit over here, if I can get the camera to cooperate. Uh, it's kind of tucked inside the reactor, but that's okay. We're just going with integrated parts on this build. Um, it can store gaseous uh, components of other things, plus a little bit of room for hydrogen peroxide. So I've got all the room I need to do a hydrogen peroxide cycle, um, be it electrolyzing water and then using the H2 and O2 to make HTP or H2O2, um, or I can go through the hydrazine cycle and do it kind of a backwards way um, using ammonia as a catalyst. Um, well, it's actually not really a catalyst since it gets used up. Um, but besides that, I, I've got you know ammonia just in case I have to do it a weird way. Um, and that, so basically, as long as this thing can reach an atmosphere, it can refuel. Um, don't plan on landing on many rocky planets since it's a plane um, would stand to reason that I would mostly use this for near um, you know near near Kerbin or maybe around Duna 
um, Eve, you know, that, that sort of, well, it'd probably blow up in Eve, but uh, Laith, um, things of that nature, you know, other planets with an atmosphere is, is what I would really go for there. Um, all right, I don't have an actual rudder on this plane, so I'm going to have to see if I can steer. There we go. No, it's probably, okay, we're just going to restart and then launch. Uh, should have put a rudder on there, <laughs> um, but I didn't. Oh well. All right. So yeah, um, w when I build stuff, you know, it's mostly just uh, you know what's what's its mission, what do I want it to do, what can it do for me, um, how does it really fit into my game. Um, obviously, you're gonna rip the guts out of that and put other stuff in there as it fits to your game. Um, as far as building something that can do everything and never have to touch down ever, just like a generation ship, I mean, I'm still working on that too. So I haven't gotten there yet. Maybe I'll get better and one day I'll have one. But for, for now, like I, you know, I, I try to make them small and efficient, but also, um, every now and then they're going to need to be refueled by something. <laughs> okay, let's launch this thing. Sorry for talking so long. Here we go. Um, oh yeah, uh, I got the thermal turbojet on here, and it's scaled up to like the three seven five range. Um, so it's thermal turbojet uh, fuel source is atmospheric or hydrogen peroxide, and a pebble bed reactor scaled up to three point uh, seven five or whatever it is, um, the big one. Uh, next step up from two and a half. Um, it's full on uranium nitride. I probably could have just like only put the minimum amount to make it lighter, but I just went with the whole thing because it's got plenty of thrust to weight ratio anyway. Um, so yeah, anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and take off. Oh yeah, and I definitely want to start off slow because this thing will rip itself apart on the runway. Doesn't need much to get off the ground. Once we get those wheels stored away, and we can crank up the throttle. There we go. All right. Approaching Mach 1. There we go. Mach 1. All right. So we're going to kind of cant up at about... Oh. We just blew up. <laughs> I shouldn't have touched that dial. Let's try that one more time. <laughs> So I was going to say that we're going to just kind of go at about 10 degrees for a while until we gain a little bit of altitude very slowly because this thing will rip apart, but I kind of tilted up a little bit too hard and ripped apart anyway. So let's try that again. So most important thing, um, definitely not going to touch the controls here, just going to leave it locked in place and let it take itself all the way up. Um, not really going to adjust um, our pitch or anything until we're in much, much thinner atmosphere. Um, so yeah, let's take that. I'll probably speed this video up, um, but if I don't, um, you know, thanks for bearing with her, just go ahead and skip forward to the parts that you want to actually take a look at. <laughs> if you're curious though, we'll follow this thing all the way up and you can see kind of how the aerodynamics uh, on this particular shape work. And there's our radiators inside the cargo bay start to glow. As far as air intakes, we got uh, the shock cone intakes and then a couple of adjustable ramp intakes um, on either side. And that's about it. Got radiator wings and tail fins. Uh, for most of the lifting surfaces, and then the little aeroplane main wing in the back with a bunch of control surfaces, uh, some struts, everything's auto strutted. Um, and then, yeah, big old thermal turbojet currently pumping out two and a half uh, or 2500 kilonewtons. Uh, we're doing about 980 meters per second, we're at about 
9, uh, 10,000 meters. Alright, so we're not still not going to touch the dial, we're not going to adjust pitch or anything, it's just going to keep on going. Steady climb. Um, definitely there are more efficient launch profiles, but since this thing will rip apart if I sneeze too hard, um, we just lock it in and let it let it do its thing. It's more than more than capable, so we don't have to fiddle with it. Till about 33,000 meters, so 33 kilometers ish, um, and then we'll probably switch to uh, hydrogen peroxide for a little bit and then kind of coast the rest of the way with the, the momentum just kind of carrying us. Alright, so we're getting close, so it's time to kind of pitch down just a hair. Hopefully, we can. All this is going to do, because it's only producing about 5 kilonewtons, 4, four kilonewtons, um, all that's going to do is actually throw heat out the back, um, which you definitely kind of want to do at this point. So we're going to see if we can safely nose down a little, so we're not such a big sail. There we go. Okay, now we're going to a little warm up there up front. So again, um, not even one kilonewton coming out the back of this engine, so I know you see it looks like there's a trail that's not producing any thrust to be meaningful. All it's doing is expelling heat, which is what we want it to do. Uh, our apoapsis is still falling, as you can see, uh, but we got plenty of time before we're in danger of uh, coming back into the atmosphere. So we're going to we're at 60,000 meters, so we got about 10,000 to go. Current apoapsis is 81,578, 77, 76, so we're good. Just gonna coast along, I suppose I could just speed time up a little better. And then final a little bit. Okay. So that was a little maneuver nude. There. We'll warp to our little maneuver node. We'll 
closer to it, right about there, and fire. There we go. Okay, uh, apoapsis 89,366 meters, periapsis 82,515 meters. Not the most efficient launch in the world, but we are still, um, we use less than half of our fuel. Uh, started off with 41,100 units of hydrogen peroxide. Uh, still have 25,705 units of hydrogen peroxide. So used less than half overall, less than half of our fuel. Uh, so that's cool. Um, so from here, uh, can do a couple of things. Let's open up our cargo bay. There we go. Can get our things that's going there. There. plan that one out very well, did I? Let's do something like that. Alright, so we're not getting any power right now because I don't have the melt stick turned on. Alright, so communication's established. Uh, it's up here in space. Um, I could, you know, start collecting data like, you know, gravity and, you know, stuff like that. Um, normally what I would do though is immediately turn on my refrigerator here and take an atmospheric sample. Check it out. Getting water, getting oxygen, getting hydrogen in teeny amounts, but significantly I'm getting water. Uh, it's creeping up on there. Um, so you just let that go for a little while. Check power usage. That's using 8 megawatts out of my available 17-ish megawatts. Um, so it's a little power intensive uh, to scoop that water up, which is why we have beam power as a backup. Let's uh, take a look at the refinery. Toggle refinery window. All right, so we're gonna do a fast and dirty um, hydrogen peroxide cycle tutorial while this thing's up here in orbit. Um, ideally you'd want to be a little bit closer, like maybe, you know, 72, honestly 70,001 meter, <laughs> um, or like right in the atmosphere and then like, you know, burn a little bit to stay in orbit, to, um, something like that. But we're, we're going to see what we can do way up here. Um, but first we're going to turn on the matchstick and I'm going to check on my cat. So I'll be right back. <laughs> 